we're going to transition to our time of teaching. And uh, I'm really excited. So we've been going through this series on relationships and called the color value of relationships. And we've talked about several different of them. Uh, we started off, we talked about uh, divorce and what that looks like. We've talked about personality differences. We've talked about um, extending grace to each other. We've talked about relationships among the church and amongst other churches. And we've, we've talked about, and I, I, and I brought it up, a while ago that we're, we're partnering with a counseling service to be able to provide help and understanding in relationships, sometimes when relationships are broken, sometimes when ourselves need a little help and guidance so we can be a better support in those relationships. And so today, uh, we welcome uh, more counseling services. I'm going to invite Stephanie Moore up to the front. And she's going to bring uh, some information in terms of the things that God has laid on her heart and, and her professional uh, understanding and experience in terms of counseling. And at the end of her time, I'm going to come back up. We're going to have some Q&A, a uh, brief time there, and we're going to point you some resources and, and help you understand a little bit more. But would you welcome Stephanie Moore, please? Well, don't clap too soon because <laughs> uh, I told last service that I needed a lot of grace because that was the first time I'd ever done a sermon. Um, so this is the second time. So... I was um, told I could come back. Anyway, uh, I actually used to live here a few years ago. Uh, my husband is Charlie Moore, and he was a pastor um, over at the Methodist Church with Barry Whipke. And then we were appointed to Sunnycrest United Methodist Church in Sioux Falls. So I still am up here once a week, and, um, and there just continues to be a need for healing and, and help. And so I, as I've kind of dove into the little pockets of where people were still hurting, I noticed that right in our, our church is where a lot of people were hurting, but were hiding it. And, and I, I told the last service too, uh, I never thought I would be in the ministry as well. When I met my husband, he said, there's no way I would ever become a pastor. And I'm like, well, good, then we can get married, no problem. <laughs> um, then we got married and about a year later, he, he said, well, I think I, I might need to do this. And um, I was trying to think of if there's a way I could get out of it. But um, no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm very blessed and I love that he chose that path. And, you know, what happened was I became a pastor's wife. Um, and, and I will go into that label and other labels that maybe a lot of you are trying to live up to in your life. And that's what I see when people are walking into church, is we're here to love one another and to have grace for one another. But unfortunately, sometimes we only do that on Sundays. And it's easy to fake it for a couple hours. <laughs> then you go home, and sometimes we live like misery the rest of the week. So I'm just here to tell you that I find it really important to incorporate your faith and your spirituality as a part of healing. So I specifically will reach out to pastors and say, is there any way we can partner and use each other to just love people and help them heal. So Pastor Kirby and I have gotten to know each other pretty well the past few months, and I'm just so grateful that we're here. So starting tomorrow, actually, we will have some support groups in Madison. Two of them will be here at Living Hope. Another one will be at the Methodist Church. But um, there's two groups that I will have Rosie Hansen come talk about. She is... Um, a licensed addictions counselor and has been a mentor of mine for a few years and wonderful lady. She's been around Madison too for quite a while, so some of you may know her, but I just want her to come up and introduce herself. Good morning. Um, I was here earlier and I wanted to share what a wonderful congregation. When I got out of my car, a gentleman helped me get through the ice onto the curb. Two ladies met me at your east door. I come down the hall. Carrie gave me a hug. I sat over here, and Mrs. McGilvery said, who are you? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know what? There's a spirit here, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I have a lot of experience because I'm old. I shared that earlier, okay? <laughs> um, I have been doing this for many, many, many years. So starting tomorrow night, and I shared earlier, I talked to my weatherman this morning, and he said we are going to have wonderful weather the next 12 Mondays so people can make it to group. No snow, no rain, sunshine, no wind. 
So um, we will start tomorrow night, and the first one is going to be rebuilding relationships, and this is for divorce or loss of a relationship, and it's very painful. So this group will identify and address rebuilding it, the trust, the love, the forgiveness, the guilt, and the healing part of that. The second group will be codependent no more, treating codependency, it will be by Melody Beatty. Each group will receive a book. Codependency is finding myself finding out who I am. I'm a good caretaker. I take care of a lot of people, and sometimes I forget about me. So I'm going to learn to take care of me. And I need help with that, and I need support, and I just want to say this is a wonderful congregation to do that in. I'm going to pass this to Stephanie. Thank you, Rosie. <laughs> So uh, with that, I, I'll be doing another group, and that one will be at the Methodist Church, and that's on grief. So um, progressing through grief is what it's called, and if you've lost a loved one, a spouse, a child, um, if you've lost a home, uh, I know in Sioux Falls, flooding was horrible. I couldn't even get my child to daycare because 41st Street was blocked off and 12th Street was blocked off, and I was trapped, and I thought, if I try to go around, I might not get my child back. But there are a lot of homes that are completely destroyed. So um, if you lose something like that, that's, that's a tough process, or a job, or you're estranged from somebody. That's all part of a grief process. But uh, we do need a chance to heal, and we're really uncomfortable talking about death as well and how do we support people that have lost someone or something um, so uh, that one starts at 5 30 rosie starts at 5 30 the rebuilding one and then um, the codependent no more starts at 6 30. and we will be in the coffee house afterwards to give you some more details uh, and we'd like to know who you are before you show up i mean there, there can be some people that show up out of the blue but we just have a few things we like to go over with you too before coming but we're really excited about it um, so I, I mentioned I became a pastor's wife, didn't expect it, but oh my gosh, that is a world that, I, I mean, is different. And I'm sure there's spouses in here of uh, clergy and staff members that understand. It's a wonderful opportunity, but there's also a lot of labels that you, you live up to. There's expect, worldly expectations. Human beings have expectations that there's never anything wrong. We must be perfect because, you know, our spouse is a pastor in the ministry. Um, you have a perfect family. You have this cute little two-year-old, and life just must be grand. Well, yeah, I'm very blessed. I have a lot of great things going on, but there's still a lot of times of trial, of hurt, and things that we, because we're, we're essentially leaders of the church, we have to do our best to hold it together for everyone else and, and find our circle where we can let our guard down and, and we have a lot of great people that allow us to be that way. But you know, whether you're a police officer, whether you're an educator or whether you work on maintenance or own your own business or stay at home with your children, those are all labels where you have to act a certain way and that was never given to us by God. Those are all worldly expectations and then we put them on ourselves. And unfortunately what happens is when we come to church, we take things to the extreme and sometimes feel ashamed that we aren't a good enough Christian or we didn't do this enough or that's why my life is so horrible because I'm not praying enough. And it really saddened me when I started seeing a lot of people that were faithful Christians come in and say, I must be punished. I must, I must just be um, needing to repent of so many bad things I've done and uh, I don't have any hope left, and where's God? And that is really sad to me. Um, and these are people that are involved in everything, okay? These are people that are doing everything they can to be that good Christian, but they're neglecting to address that pain and are assuming that no one loves them and that they're being judged by their own church people. Now, I'm sure everyone does whatever they can to be loving and welcoming. And like Rosie said, yes, you guys are awesome. It's been a wonderful experience, very welcoming. Um, but unfortunately, there have even been maybe some leaders, uh, Christian leaders or Christian friends that have said something they didn't realize was more damaging, that brought you more shame. Um, my husband will freely admit, he tries to give the best advice he can, but he's a human being. He's like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Now they're going to just 
be hard on themselves more and more, you know. Um, so if someone has said something and it's made you feel more ashamed and they're Christian and it's caused you to either isolate yourself or be way more involved than you ever anticipated um, in church because of that guilt or um, you just wrote off church for a while altogether, I'm sorry. Um, but remember, we're humans and, and I think we forget in our faith that love, grace, and forgiveness is what we need to focus on. So that's why I want to bridge the gap and work with church leaders and not put a blanket over your faith and say, oh, we're just going to work on, you know, uh, you know, let's go get you some pills. Let's go, you should come this many sessions and you'll be good, or we just need to do this and this. No, you need your faith, you need your pastoral counsel too. But we can bridge those together. And we need to bridge those together. Um, because pastors are humans too. They don't have the answers all the time. And there's power in, in numbers. And I don't know, if you come to me and, and think I'm going to tell you how to interpret the Bible or what your faith believes and tell you what, what's right and wrong, that's not what I do. And that's why I use Kirby. So if he's a trusted person, we use him to support what you want to work on in your faith and combine that with the mental health techniques that are, are there. Um, so that's why it's so important to work together and provide a community to heal. And that is also why we have these groups that are forming. Um, Sheila mentioned in her sermon that a lot of times people are trying to figure out who am I and you know, what is my purpose moving forward. You may not know. You may be terrified of even opening up about I'm just a normal person. I may have this really important job where I have to pretend like I'm perfect, but I can actually talk about the stuff I'm struggling with. And in those groups, we, we will help you with that process. You don't even have to talk the first few weeks if you don't want to. We're just there to love you and build you up while you're trying to figure it out. And there's going to be other people there that will love you unconditionally, and that will be our expectation. And we want to help you incorporate that in your life so there's room for peace and joy. It is so exhausting to live up to labels. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a, I'm a full-time, I own a uh, mom with a two-year-old, first child, and my husband's a pastor. And, you know, way back in this generation, it's more normal for, you know, wives to, to work and have a child. But as a pastor's wife, oh, my goodness, there are some people that think I am really bad for not being home every day but you know I it's it's a really hard thing to figure out what's God's will for me and I've had to really pray on that um, and remember that that um, it's very exhausting to live up to everyone's expectations and I need to be right with God and myself and forgive myself for who I am I'm going way off script like completely um, yeah I, there's a million pages up here, and thank goodness I'm going off script because I would take up the whole time. Okay, so where am I? Oh, the, uh, here's some reality for you, and I, I love that Kirby is open to addressing facts that are sometimes a sensitive subject but are really important to not deny. Even as Christians, we can't live in a false reality. Um, suicide... Yes, I said suicide is the number two cause of death for people that are ages 11 to 35. Okay, the number one cause of death is car accidents, but mm, a lot of those car accidents could be suicides because the only way you can confirm it's a suicide is if there's a note and evidence that there were plans leading up to that. So the coroner can never know uh, to, deem, to deem that. So. There's a crisis right now. People are ending their lives because they're in so much pain. And a lot of people in here are at high risk for that. So there's certain demographics that if you have this as part of who you are, um, that makes you very high risk. And I'm not saying you are, so don't think I'm judging you, but these are just stats that are out there. Um, if you're white, if you're male, if your age is 40 to 65, and if you live in a rural community. So that's a lot of us in here, most of us. You know, it's not worth it to be alone and to disappear from church because you feel like everyone's being judgmental. 
Um, and, and if they are, talk to Kirby, because I don't think he would like that. What I've found is living hope is really living to its name. It, it's providing hope here. And, you know, the other thing is don't get so over-involved and be all action, but no um, depth in your relationships like Kirby's been talking about. There's different levels of intimacy with yourself, with God, and with others. And this is an opportunity to learn that. You do not need to deal with the pain and agony alone. Remember, you are a child of God, and he would never, ever want you to be alone. So, there's a lot more in here I, I could keep talking about as I page through. Um, but I have one verse that I think sums it up and what I hope, you know, we can provide as, as hope for you. I'm going to get my Bible app out here. But it's Jeremiah 29, 11, and the story behind this verse is uh, my husband, he carries a little card, a business card in his wallet because when he was divorced, um, I'm his second marriage, so he's gone through a lot. That was a rock-bottom point for him. This is the verse that kept him going. Okay. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. So I wanted to end on that, and I think Kirby is going to put me on the spot again. So. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Well, Stephanie, thank you. Um, I, I have really had a distinct joy and a pleasure of getting to know Stephanie for the last several months and um, pursuing this thing. And, and one of the f first things I, I noticed in experience coming to Madison was human, humankind, I mean, really, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of hurt. There's, there's a lot of brokenness. And I, I don't think that's anything different in other places. Um, but there were some, some things that some people were looking for help, and it was above my pay grade, essentially, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't do it a, a righteous, hi, pretty girl. <laughs> um, you got her, Dad. You got her. <laughs> yes. Um, so... As, as your staff and advisory council, we started trying to figure out how in the world are we going to provide some of that hope to our community and surrounding areas. And essentially, your, your staff who you trust and empower stared at each other and like, I have no idea. And um, thankfully, their relationship developed and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you and hearing your heart and, and it's been great. And so I want to transition. I want to do a little Q&A. I, I, I have some questions on my, my mind, and as you're talking, you, you're speaking my language, essentially, and this week has been one of those things. It's like, what in the world am I doing? Like, there is no way God has asked me to do this job because I'm pretty much failing at everything right now, right? Mm -hmm. Very encouraging week. It was really awesome. Um, but the reality is, I don't say that for pity, I say that the reality is there are times as, as a pastor that I, I struggle with this stuff, that, mm -hmm. that, that label, that, that desire to keep up and desire to um, almost impress and do some things. And so um, it's a challenge for all of us and, and being able to um, get some support and encouragement. And, and I mentioned it uh, last week as well that there are people in my life that I talk to on a regular basis for encouragement and support and, and, and mm -hmm. things of that, mentorships. Um, but one of the things that I've held on to in, in terms of all of this stuff, in terms of a holistic picture of loving God and a holistic picture of faith is found in Luke chapter 10. And, and it's this time where somebody comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what's... What do you see in, in all this? What should we do? And Jesus says, what is the, the greatest commandment? And the man answered this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, right, bingo. Do this and you will live. 
Jesus is giving us a beautiful picture that to love God, to follow him, it's with everything we are. It's, it's our physical bodies, it's our mental health, it's our souls. And as followers of Jesus, sometimes we get so focused on just making sure our spiritual health is good that we lose sight of, of the physical ability, the physical bodies, we let them deteriorate. We ignore the mental health concerns and, and we just don't allow it to happen. But to have a holistic faith, Jesus has come to me with everything. And so to understand that and do that, we need to kind of have a healthier understanding of being able to worship God. And oftentimes, the struggles I know that I have internally put up a roadblock between me and God sometimes. Mm-hmm. And am I worth anything? Am I doing any good? Like, like your husband, did I say the wrong thing? Because my ongoing things, and my wife can attest to this, is like the only time I open my mouth is to change feet. And it's terrible. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's just the, it's just the reality. Um, <laughs> sorry. But there's a reality within our, our, our mental health that, that needs to be addressed sometimes. And so a couple, couple of, of questions. Um, why do you think it is, in general, that people, and I think you talked a little bit about it, why do you think people choose not to get help? Mm-hmm. I mean, let's, we're at a church, right? We, we, we're here, uh, maybe you're just here visiting because we have a really adorable baby or just other things, but... Mm-hmm. There's a stigma, I think, within churches. Yes, yeah, so a stigma is, is huge in churches. And again, that's why I'm passionate about this. I want to be a presence or any mental health organization to be a presence and part of this and to validate that God uses people to help heal and, and that you can all be part of that um, you know, by, being, by reaching out to people, but um, also encouraging them that it's okay, you're not less than, you know, I, believe it or not, my husband and I, we have gone to marriage counseling, and I will openly say that that's what we do, I will go get counseling when I need it, I'm a human being, I'm a counselor myself, okay, but we all need to seek counsel for when we don't know what path to go, but the shame that people feel, and especially in the Midwest, especially in rural communities, you know, I'm sure you've all heard this before, you know, you pull your bootstraps up and you just got to move on and tough it out. Well, we forget we're not machines, we're not robots, we're actually human beings and that was a gift from God and we need to celebrate that and not be ashamed of it. And when we're struggling, it's okay to say, hey, you know, I need some help. So for you guys to reach out to people and encourage them and to not make them feel ashamed is probably the best thing you can do. Well, and the reality is not everybody even has some bootstraps to pull themselves up by. Hmm, and that's and true. how do we, <laughs> yeah. we, we breach that? I mean, we, right. we laugh, but we don't recognize the, the brokenness and hurt to begin with. We just, we oversimplify it sometimes. And, and that becomes a challenge in faith too. Um, now I lost my other thought. Um, sorry. But w- let's talk, there, there, there for a long time, there was like this, this black and white line that separated faith and science or faith and biology God and science, and, and I, from a, from a pastor's side, I, I think some of that line is, is blurring and going away, and I am really thankful for that, um, but can you speak, how do these two marriage, because some would say, you just need to get some medication, right? Now, we laugh in a church community, but let me say this, a lot of times in the church community, you say, you just need to pray about it, okay? We oversimplify things. Can you talk a little bit between faith and science? Absolutely, I can. So obviously, there's been plenty of studies where there's a real chemical imbalance. It's just like if somebody had diabetes or was diagnosed with a heart condition, they need medicine to survive. And in fact, suicide is the number two cause of death, remember, for people ages 11 to 35. So why are we not treating this as we do diabetes and other health conditions. This is a crisis that we ignore. However, on the flip side, we are, you know, we like quick fixes. So a lot of people will say, oh, you just need medication. Well, my job, if someone comes into my office, number one, I really like to gauge where are they at with their faith. That doesn't mean I push faith on them. That is not something I start with. But if it's a, if it's a really important part of their life, and they're exploring that, we've got to incorporate that in their healing process. So 
we include that. And then I have Kirby help me clarify to people, because coming from me doesn't work very well. And I'm, I didn't go to seminary. So I like to, you know, if someone says, you know, am I not praying enough? Or what the heck am I doing wrong as a Christian? I'm going to, first of all, love them for who they are because I'm a Christian and that's, that's what I believe in and forgive them and, and give them grace and um, then let Kirby kind of talk them through. Is this wrong? What have I done wrong? But if, if we can't work through some things because the mental health symptoms are so extreme, you can't even make your appointments because you can't get out of bed or um, the anxiety is so strong, you can barely talk and just stumble over your words that it's so severe. Sometimes we do need to get those chemicals in, in check so you can start healing and take the edge off. So that's how you, you meld it together, but it's never a, oh, you just need to go pray more, or hey, you go see the doc and get a script. We gotta take case by case and be open-minded. Hmm. It doesn't sound easy. It's not. <laughs> it's not easy. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. All right, I'm just <laughs> joking. All right. So this one is personal uh, for me personally, but I've also I've also been on the receiving end of uh, of some of these concerns. Now, it should be evident that I'm a man, right? Okay. Yep. Um, I hope. I, <laughs> yes. So the challenge you talked about the bootstraps, but I think okay, men. We're prideful, right? Wives, women, shh. Men, we're prideful, right? I mean, it's just the reality. We pull up ourselves up with bootstraps. We can take care of it. And, 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 and just that you talked about the should haves. You know, men, we deal with these should haves too. I should be providing. I should be able to fix this. I should be able to do this. I should be a good father, a good husband. I should, I should, I should. And so women, I know, struggle with this as well. I've talked to my wife a lot about it, just the shoulds and the guilt that creates. But men have these shoulds as well. But there is a thing within men that says, I'm not going to get help. I'm not going to reach out to anybody or talk to anybody, even another guy, because I'd rather just sit and watch the ball game. And there's, there's, there's that fear of, of vulnerability. But let's be honest. So if I come to you, so my wife and I, maybe we're having some concerns, some marital problems, and we come to you for some help. I sit down, I'm like, oh, great, another woman, now I'm going to get ganged up on. <laughs> okay, hold on. Everybody laughs, but 99% of the men in here would say, amen, hallelujah, because there is a legitimate fear. This isn't on you, this is on, but there, I have experienced it. Many men have come to me, and I've talked with many men, and it's like, they're just going to tell me everything I'm doing wrong. And I hear that all the time already. I don't want to hear it. It's, and, and there's this overwhelming fear. And so it holds back so many men of getting help because why should I go talk to somebody just to find out I'm screwing everything up again? Can you, from a female perspective who is a counselor and somebody at this point that I'm, I'm really starting to trust, can you speak into how can we as men get through some of our pride I don't know if that's possible. But overcome some of these barriers to really understand that it's okay to say, hey, look, I'm, I need some help. Um, I need help either in my marriage or maybe just as me as a person. Or, hey, I've got a history of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this will answer it, but if you, these should haves that you talked about, when I said the suicide rate is really high for males, and for those 40 to 65, those are usually men that are still having kids. My, my husband had a child, his first child at 45. So um, that's a stressor. Plus, you've got aging parents that you might have pressures on. Plus, you're providing for a family. Um, plus, oh, crap, I'm supposed to retire. Am I ever going to retire? I can't make ends meet. And I, you know, that's why it's so high for someone in that demographic. But men, of course, very prideful, um, want to appear that they have it all together and, oh, I just need to do this better. But again, then rely on your faith and remember, let God love you and hold you and cherish you. Let him be there for you and let, you know, let him be non-judgmental and do that for yourself. Um, I can't force you to believe that. 
or, you know, uh, get rid of that pride, but you deserve that just as much as women do or anybody else. <laughs> um, a little bit about, though, my approach. Yes, I'm female. Most counselors are because we just are more comfortable with this, I guess, with the way we're wired. But there are male counselors out there. But again, it's it's the pride factor. But for me, I really, really try hard to, um, if it's a couple, they come visit with me the, um, together because it's a problem that the couple needs to tell me that they have together. That's what we're treating. But then I usually have to meet with them separately. Actually, I make it mandatory they meet with me separately afterwards at least once um, to discuss their side without their spouse there so I get their viewpoint on what's going on. And both voices are heard. And then we come back together and then set goals from after I've heard both sides. Now, the other reason why I reach out to churches and pastors who've had a little bit of training in you know, listening and care, pastoral care, that kind of stuff, because if there's a male like Kirby available and he's comfortable sitting in there just as support. So it's not two women against one male. It can be really helpful. And I'm lucky because I'm married to a pastor. So oftentimes if they go to our church and, you know, we sign releases, we make sure all of that's done, of course. Um, but, you know, we make sure that both sides are representative, that person's feeling uncomfortable. And I encourage Kirby to call me out if I'm completely missing something because again I'm a human being I, I make mistakes too so that's what I do to try to help that situation awesome well I want to be respectful of of your time but also of yours and we are at our designated service time um, but I want to give you a, a couple things Stephanie I'm going to invite you you can head off talk to the coffee shop or whoever of your your team if you want more information there's something on the back of your bulletin um, phone email thing of that nature um, you can also go to the coffee shop. She's going to have brochures. She's going to have information. You can ask for that. Um, and we are just understanding that there is one at the Methodist Church, and we are in full support of, so this is not just a living hope thing, okay? That is not what this is about. Um, but I really encourage you to figure out what are some things that maybe I have packed down deep. What are some things that maybe we can get help on? I'm a firm believer in one of the, if you're married or you're even in a relationship, or you're thinking about being in a relationship, one of the best times to work on that relationship is in a non-conflict time, when heads are cool and level to continue ongoing care and support. So I encourage you on that. Uh, but at this time, let me pray for you, and uh, we'll go from here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship this morning. God, to, to hear a little bit about um, the way you've created us and designed us. And I know you created this world just a perfect, beautiful picture. But unfortunately, there was a point where evil entered in and it's kind of messed up your whole creation. And because of that evil, it has broken your perfect system and, and, and our bodies are imperfect, our minds are imperfect and, and just things are out of whack. And, and, and God, we're discovering things within your creation. Scientists and doctors and, and researchers are, are discovering things that you've put in place to help us care for your creation. Help us to be good stewards of our body, our mind, our soul, and, and, our, and everything we have, even the earth that you gave us. Father, thank you for the opportunity to have a conversation this morning in, in a subject that sometimes gets very difficult and, and, and scary, but I pray that you'd spur us on. In your name, amen.